Uh, okay, extending the open toolkit. How many people here have already extended the toolkit? Quite a few. Okay, well, we'll see if you learn something new, hopefully. And yeah, a little bit about me there. You can see I'm already, I think, doubling my tweet count today, which tells you I don't tweet very often. A uh, little bit of overview of what we're going to cover, basically how you can customize the toolkit. Uh, some simple ways, straightforward ways, uh, some bad ways, and uh, mostly focusing on plugins. <coughs> Who am I? Yeah, I've been working on the toolkit since it started pretty much. Working on authoring tools with IBM 15 years, almost all of that with Ditto. And worked on the spec as well. And uh, who here uses the command line, by the way? I was wondering that. Quite a few. Oh, oh Elliot waved me off. Okay. I don't, I don't like to let Elliot take back his answers, but I'll, I'll go with that one. Uh, so I guess that means most of you probably do it through some other tool like Oxygen. Um, and I already asked about customizing the toolkit. Anybody out there, as far as you know, using 153 or earlier? One person. I feel sorry for you. Um, but, yeah. Anybody tried out the 2.0 uh, milestone test builds yet? We got a couple. Most of them involved with the project, but not all of them. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, ways, uh, what we're here to learn, ways to extend the OT, uh, how to do it, how not to do it, and how to get started with plugins if you're not already. Uh, so a little bit about terminology first. Uh, when I've given talks about this in the past, I try to talk about how to do things without programming. And I've learned over time that people have different definitions of programming. Uh, who thinks using a command line is programming? Nobody. Wow, this is a good audience for me. Um, creating an ant build, is that programming? Yeah. Well, writing an ant build. Uh, writing CSS? Yeah. XSLT? I, it's not for me anymore, but I'm one of those weirdos, I think. Uh, is that programming? <laughs> That's actually DITA in binary, uh, for those who didn't want to look it up. Uh, so yeah, methods in this presentation will require various levels of programming. <coughs> <laughs> uh, the one that returned <laughs> Google search for binary conversion. Uh, so yeah, this is still a technical presentation, and yeah, a presentation about Customizing the toolkit can get a little dull. Uh, so please interrupt with questions. It'll wake everybody up. Uh, if I'm going too fast, too slow, if I say something that doesn't make sense, um, I'd like it if you'd like stand up and do a little twirl. That would get my attention, probably others. Uh, but you can also just raise your hand. Anybody in the audience have any idea where that photo's from, by the way? Uh, China, no? It is Iceland, beautiful Iceland. A guy riding his bike around the country. Uh, anyway, okay. Starting off with customizing with a light touch. A uh, couple ways you can do that. Processing parameters. I'm betting most of you are already familiar with those. Uh, CSS and then, yeah, the danger zone. Uh, processing parameters are pretty straightforward. Uh, the few of you who use the command line have already used them. Uh, Oxygen and other tools that have GUIs on top convert most of those into nice little uh, GUI entry fields so you don't have to see parameter names. Parameter names can get a little bit ugly. Um, but some of the parameters apply everywhere. Some are specific to a format. Uh, probably uh, pretty obvious for most of that. Uh, they do affect the output, though. Some of them, uh, like the draft comment, decides whether your draft material appears in the output. Uh, you can use filters to include or exclude content. Header and footer parameters apply to all the XHTML transforms and add content. Uh, there is a parameter to turn on or off task labels if you want each of your task sections to get a little heading. Uh, it's off by default still, I believe. And then, of course, a parameter to add your own CSS. Uh, so CSS. Uh, in XHTML, if you didn't already know it, pretty much every data element, uh, at least every content element that maps to an HTML element, adds a class value. We don't use most of those classes in our default CSS, but they're there for you. If you want to make all paragraphs red, you can hook into that style. Uh, if you want to make all definition terms green, you can do that. If you want to make them blink, then your users will be very upset with you, but you can. Uh, so yeah, most of them are ignored, but this means that you can add just a few lines of CSS and really drastically change the look and feel of your HTML output. So that's a, that's a pretty light touch customization. Uh, you can, if you want, create a class for every single data element, and the maintenance would be monstrous for that, but there's nothing stopping you. Uh, yeah, XSLT. You can do a somewhat 
light touch customization uh, with XSLT. There's a parameter that lets you specify your alternate XSL uh, programming uh, module to run. Uh, basically, you know, Yarno covered the toolkit tree process uh, pretty well earlier. After that runs, whenever you create HTML, there's a single point of entry for XSL processing. It pulls in a whole bunch of modules to handle the different domains, handle concept reference, you know, everything else. But there's that single point of entry. There's a parameter on the XHTML builds that lets you specify your own XSL. We run that instead of the default. Most often when that's used, you add an import. So you pull in all the normal code and say, I want all that basic stuff, all those thousands and thousands of lines that I don't want to repeat. But I might change how uh, some element is presented. I might change how note is presented and make it a, a bigger, more exciting thing, or something like that. Anything you want, really. Any element can be customized. Uh, this is probably most useful for quick one-off overrides. Uh, I have seen it cause trouble for people when they try to maintain them. Uh, if you have a bunch of different XSL overrides and that's how you uh, customize all your output, you have to keep track of them. They generally don't live inside the toolkit. They live with your content and uh, I've seen people accidentally use their PDF override when building HTML and be really confused at the bizarre results. Um, so yeah, they, they're easy to mix up, but it's possible. Uh, PDF customization directories, I won't talk about. Um, they are unique to PDF. Uh, it was a different sort of customization method that was defined early on. Uh, it doesn't really mesh with any of the other toolkit overrides. Uh, really. Has it been officially deprecated? You know, have we labeled it deprecated? It yeah, it, it talked about disparagingly. Um, I don't know who would do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, really, the recommendation is to move over, but there's so many customization directories out there uh, that realistically it's going to be around for a long time. Uh, Yarno would like to yank it out today, I think, but uh, I, I've been trying to hold him back on that. And uh, yeah, so long-term plugins are preferred. And Lee has a talk later that will go into much more detail about customizing PDF in particular, or you can get her book for even more detail. Uh, so the danger zone. Editing did an OT code. It's open source, so I can edit what I want, right? And that's how open source works. Um, there are a lot of problems you can run into with that. Uh, primary one is that upgrades are more difficult. I wonder if that person who's still not managed to get out of the 153 uh, series is in that position because of directly edited code. I've seen people in releases that are even older and they did so many hand customizations of internal code that they can't upgrade. I mean, it's, it's just become so cost prohibitive. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that. It is hard to take advantage of new features if you're customizing things on your own. If you've really radically changed how the process runs, even if you can upgrade, you might not be calling all the new features. Uh, and of course, you might be duplicating work that others are doing. And uh, if you do do this, there's nothing I can do to stop you. I won't hunt you down. I don't do that kind of thing, unlike some in this audience. Um, I don't know where most of you live. Um, unfortunately, I think Elliot knows about where I live, so, so he may come after me. Anyway, uh, so plugins to the rescue. There are a lot of things you can do with plugins. Pretty much anything you want to change in the toolkit, you should be able to do with a plugin. So why use it? Well, because it avoids all the dangers I just talked about. Uh, beyond those, it is much easier to share your customizations. You can give it to somebody else on your team. You can give it to some other company you're working with. They're really easy to distribute. Uh, with the upcoming Ditto OT 2.0, they're even easier to install. There's a new command line where you just say, Ditto install my plugin. It adds it. Uh, you don't even have to unzip anymore. Uh, it just works with many vendor products, certainly not all of them, but there are a lot of vendors that embed the toolkit, and uh, for a subset of those, it's, it's made very easy to integrate plugins. And uh, it does insulate you from a lot of the changes. So, yeah, make it independent of the code. So what is a plugin, actually? It is a zip file. Uh, it's a zip file that has a control file called plugin.xml. That could be the only thing that's in your plugin. It could just define some things that are you know, just defined for use elsewhere. Uh, it could also be a few lines of XSLT, could be 50 megabytes of Java, uh, it, it could be whatever you want. Uh, the PDF2 plugin is 
pretty substantial. Elliot's did it for publishers, plugins. That's that's really a whole series of plugins that are pretty substantial. Uh, so it, it can be pretty big. Uh, as I said, 2.0 is coming with this new way to install. And you can see there, that is the command line. Dita dash install plugin zip. You can point to a file that's online. That can be a URL, HTTP. It'll download the zip and install it. Uninstalling uh, is similar. Uh, you just need a plugin ID rather than the zip name because at that point the zip's kind of irrelevant. Uh, if you're not on 2.0 yet, which apparently most of you haven't worked with the test builds yet, for some reason, uh, the way you do it today is ant-f integrator, uh, or sorry, that's that's the alternate way with 2.0. Um, the way you do it today uh, is to unzip to the plugins directory and run the toolkit integrator. Just say integrate my plugins. It goes through and reintegrates everything that's there. Uh, to delete a plugin, you delete the directory, run the integrator again, and it, it updates all the files. Uh, there are more advanced things you can do, like using alternate install locations, and I'm not really going to go into that. Um, but yes, Elliot? Can the zip contain multiple plugins? Can the zip contain multiple plugins? Nope. Because that's naughty. Oh, no, it's, <laughs> it's not. This tool right now uh, is expecting a single plugin. Uh, so, Yarno, any thought about changing that? I don't know. This, this is uh, one, of the, one of the many things Yarno has added to the new release. Okay, so um, right now it only affects one. Um, it goes into the zip file, tries to locate a plugins.xml file somewhere there and then assumes that that's the plugin and uses that. So you can have the wrappers or directories inside there. So the plugin doesn't have to be on the top level in the, plugin, uh, in the zip. But uh, right now it's only one. Maybe in the future we'll support multiple ones or then add some syntax for installing dependencies automatically. All right. Yeah, uh, most plugins I've seen previously, uh, the plugin contains a directory. That directory contains your plugin.xml. Uh, I know in Elliot's case, you've got a zip that contains many directories, and each of those contains plugin.xml. Uh, so I, I assume that was the goal there. Yeah. Sorry for all the sniffling. I had a cold last week, and it's it's pretty much gone now, but... Some traces remain. Uh, so what can you do with a plugin? <laughs> what can't you do with a plugin? I mean, isn't that a long list? <laughs> Anything you want, really. Possibilities are endless. Uh, I'll go into each of these. I don't need to read the, the thing. But I do want to say we've got samples of all of these uh, available from my website. Just very simple, uh, very simple samples. And uh, this, I know this, these presentations will be available. The link's in there. I'll talk more about those later. Uh, but that means you don't need to try to scribble down syntax as I'm going because these, these samples are available. Okay, so a basic customization, XSLT processing. Uh, this can be used, uh, this plugin right here is a complete plugin that adds a theoretical company logo to every XHTML page. Uh, I know it's small print for those on the back. This is a plugin.xml file. It says Here's some extra HTML code I want to add to every build. This is an XSL code, uh, XSL override snippet, whatever. And it takes advantage of some code that's already there, generate user header, and says, when this runs, I want to stick out my logo. So this right here is a complete, effective, potentially useful plugin. You can add your logo to every HTML page. So how exactly did that work? The plugin.xml file, it contains three main things. There's an ID attribute. Every ID has to be unique among plugins. That's a common screw up that I make when I'm trying out a new plugin. I forget to change that. I end up with two plugins that have the same idea and Toolkit's not happy with me. So the important things there are the ID and then the feature. The feature says, what am I doing with this plugin? I'm overriding XHTML. How am I doing that? With this XSL file. That's it. So this presentation was supposed to say, how crazy can you get? This is not crazy. This does not count as crazy. 
Uh, finding the right spot to override can be difficult. Uh, if you have not read all of the XSL, even if you have read all of the XSL, it can, can be difficult. Um, extension points are available for pretty much any of the XSL steps that run. You can modify those pre-processing steps that ran earlier. One of the things that annoys Yarno, I know, because um, that's one of those places where we don't know if anybody's actually doing this, but we can't remove it because someone might be. Uh, it makes it harder to change the code when we open it up like that. But it's there. And I'm assuming we'll have a little bit of time at the end. I'll give some tips for finding the right spot to override. Uh, you can add parameters that are sent in to your XSL files. Why would you do this? A uh, simple example here, uh, you could create a new parameter called day, and then in your ant build, you automatically set that. It's passed in uh, to every XHTML build. And then if you build on Wednesday, everything comes out in reverse, because why not? That would be a little bit crazy. More realistically, it might print out the current date at the bottom of every page so that people know what review version they're looking at, for example. Any questions so far? No? A few heads nodding. I hope that's not because they're sleeping. Um, OK. Uh, XSL parameters, a uh, complex, more realistic example uh, that isn't really crazy. Uh, you might define a new parameter. It's called my target. It specifies exactly what type of HTML you're going to. Uh, if you're producing XHTML for several different rendering platforms, for example, uh, that parameter could then be passed into your build. Whenever you build, either with your script itself or on the command line or whatever, you set that as one of your parameters. And then use some XHTML to pick it up and, and do snazzy things based on that parameter. Uh, so yeah, some examples here. If you're going to Eclipse, you might remove next previous links because the framework will give it for you. Uh, other things might add special styles, add revision markers, something like that. And uh, as I say, there are other ways to do this. That's true with a lot of plugins. Uh, there are multiple approaches you can take to get the same result. And some of them depend on your comfort level with different types of code. Uh, some of them, uh, yeah, some of them just, you could get really complex, and, and Elliot might like to work with those uh, just because it's more fun to do that. Um, but Uh, adding DTDs or XSDs, or presumably in the future, RNGs. <coughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, this is helpful for those who are using document type shells or uh, specializations. You want to zip those up into a plugin, which makes it easily shareable, uh, makes it easy to drop it into different systems like Oxygen, uh, makes it easy to send to all the people you work with, your translation vendor, whatever. Uh, you have a plugin that zips them up, you have a catalog that says, these are all my DTD entries, and then you have a plugin.xml file, that, that handy little control file that says, here's where my catalog is. Integrate it. Once you've done that, all of your DTDs are processable, or DTDs, schemas, RNGs, whatever, all your grammar files. Ant targets. Uh, target is essentially a function in Ant. Uh, it's something that you call as part of the processing pipelines. Each of those steps that uh, Yarno described earlier are typically uh, confined to a single target within Ant. Uh, so you might want to add your own processing. And to do that, you need your own Ant target. You might stick it in the middle of processing. More likely, you're going to insert this right after that big pre-process step. Uh, again, I'd like to highlight, for most people, hands off of pre-process. Add things right after it's done. That's doing all that heavy lifting. You don't want to mess with it. Uh, there's usually no, re no need to mess with it. Um, add something right at the end when everything's resolved for you. Everything's normalized. Uh, but if you want to go crazy, again, I promise a little bit of crazy, uh, you can run a step called call this before conref. You define that in your plugin. Say, this is my new target. I want it to be available. I want it to happen right before conref. More realistically, uh, there's this handy little thing called depends on preprocess post. It means run this after preprocess. So create your target. It runs right after the preprocessing. And of course, within the ant target, you might just have a simple statement that says, here I am. Uh, you might have a whole bunch of processing that calls out to, you know, Perl, because who doesn't like Perl? Oh, somebody doesn't like Perl. <laughs> Okay, creating a new transform type. This is getting a little more complicated. Uh, 
really the minimum requirement for this is to define the transform type and then define an ant target that, that runs it. So you might say something like PDF2 and then I need an ant target called data to PDF2. You don't need much more than that if you don't want to. Um, if you have a transform called myHTML, you can create a target called data to myHTML. All it does is call the normal HTML. There you've defined a new transform type that does nothing except redirect you back to normal XHTML. And that's actually probably a good way to get started if you're trying to create an XHTML based transform. Redirect to XHTML, make sure your plugin works, then go from there. A more realistic minimum, uh, there's going to be a new transform that calls the preprocess, because everybody should use the preprocess, and then it branches off, just like PDF goes one way, HTML goes one way, and then splits further for navigations. Yours might go a third way. Uh, yeah, samples of new data OT transform types. Uh, some data OT transforms that are delivered in the package started off as external plugins. Uh, for example, talk.js, which sort of just tweaks the XHTML a bit and produces some JavaScript frames to go around it. Uh, that was an external plugin that became pretty popular uh, through the data users group eventually shipped with the, tool, uh, with the toolkit. And of course PDF2 was originally uh, something you had to install and configure outside of the toolkit and for quite a while now, uh, six, seven years at least, uh, it has been in the toolkit and has been the default PDF transform because it was much better than the original. Uh, there are some other popular external transform types. Uh, Data for Publishers is a collection of transform types. Uh, contains things like EPUB, uh, there's also HTML Plus, which you can get out of Diddy Users. Uh, it was created years ago by Deborah Pickett. Uh, one of the more, uh, one, well, one of the crazier things really that it does is provide SVG rendering for syntax diagrams, which is a task I would hesitate to tackle on my own. But she did all that and put it out there for free, which was incredible. Uh, and many of the web help options you might see in your vendor tools are really plugins to the toolkit with new transform types. Generated text. <coughs> uh, a couple of reasons you might want to use this, but first, uh, what is generated text? Most of you have seen in your output uh, a little word that's generated like note for notations, attention might show up, um, you might get some table headings, something like that. Uh, that's what I consider generated text, that's, that's sort of what the term means. Uh, so why would you want to add this in a plugin? Uh, first, you might want to change the note, that, uh, change the text that shows up for any given item. If you don't like that it says note, uh, you can change it. So it says, hey, look at me. I'd like to see that in more technical documentation. <laughs> um, or you can add your own text. And most often that's going to go along with a new transform type or uh, some other customization where you need to put out generated text and it's not available in the core toolkit, you can add it. And uh, you can add this with uh, just English if you want. Uh, if you're working with localized files, you tend to have one XML file for each language you need to support, and they all get integrated. Yeah, and that, that text is generated based on XML length. Uh, so adding Java libraries, jar files. Uh, well, again, Java can do pretty much anything you want, so with this you're really only limited by your own skill at Java, uh, but all this is really doing is saying whatever Java file, jar file I have in my plugin, make sure that's available in the class path so that if I want to use it for uh, XSL extensions, if I want to use it for other any other programming, it's there. All right, lots more nodding. Oh, this crowd is tired. Uh, new error or diagnostic messages are another thing. And again, this could be you know, little I'm here messages, but you could be adding all sorts of new messages. You could set up your XHTML code so that it warns, hey, I've got a topic without a short description and everybody knows that's wrong. I, I'm assuming that would be the error text. Um, but yeah, it, it could be used for anything. Uh, something wrong, something right, just a little, you know, here I am in the process. And uh, yeah, this way whenever you encounter that, all you have to say is generate this message using the ID. Toolkit code looks up the ID and spits out the message. And dependencies. Uh, if you look at Elliot's plugins, you'll see a lot of dependencies. Uh, this is where one plugin depends on another. It won't work if it's not there. 
Uh, you might have a plugin that extends somebody else's plugin or another one of your own plugins. Uh, you might have a transform type that depends on some common code you've added elsewhere. And to get this dependency set up, you want to make sure your plugin has, uh, has noted that. That way, if somebody installs a plugin on its own, the toolkit isn't going to mistakenly try to run it and crash because other things aren't there. Uh, this way, when you integrate everything, you're notified. Hey, you need this other thing. Go get it. Otherwise, Elliot will hunt you down. And uh, yeah, it, I, I have seen this get complicated. And I won't name any names here, um, but it, it, it can get complicated. Uh, you can have 50 plugins that all depend on each other. And it, it can get tough to follow those dependencies. And if something goes wrong, you know, where did it happen? Uh, how do I remove some code without breaking everything else? Uh, so it, it can get difficult. So a little circular graphic there. Uh, creating your own extensions, if you want to create a whole lot more. Uh, this uh, the plugin integration is based on template files. Uh, really, whenever you run the integration, it goes through, looks for these templates, and says, oh, here's something that's extended. It's got an extension point in it. Has anybody done anything? Generate the file that's actually going to run. Uh, you can define your own templates. You can say, I have this new thing I want to let people extend. Uh, that's really the purpose of it. Uh, if you have a plugin that you expect further people to work with, uh, then you say, I have this thing that can now be extended in addition to all the other things you can already extend. Uh, so if the toolkit hasn't let you do enough, you can add this and let people do even more. Uh, so now that everything is clear, any questions? Nothing, okay. Uh, so I do have a link here to uh, the 2.0 documentation specifically to the plugin overview page, which describes all of these extension points. Uh, the sample plugins, I'll show more of that in a second. And the source for those plugins, uh, Lee White's book for uh, PDF. I promised some tips and tricks in the backup. Uh, so how to approach a plugin? Oh, yes, I see. Best practices for regression testing. Best practices for regression testing. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you mean, like, doesn't including test cases, sort of like does my plugin break the toolkit, that sort of thing? Hmm. Yeah, that was a bad question, I don't want it. Um, no, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so there, there are two aspects, and one of them is, you know, how do I know I haven't messed up other stuff in the toolkit? And uh, there's, not a, there's not a good way to do that, there's, a, there's an automated regression test that's set up for the toolkit. And it's pretty simplistic. It basically says whenever code is modified in the toolkit, run all these builds, do a literal comparison of the output, and make sure nothing's changed. Uh, so you can set that up so that whenever you have your own fork of the toolkit or your own plugin, whatever, you can do something like that. You know, I've made this change to my plugin. Have I broken anything? The problem is, if the point of your plugin is to change the output, when you get that changed output, it's going to say, hey, this doesn't match. Something went wrong. So that's not terribly useful. And so then as you progress, you have to keep saying, you know, this change is acceptable. Now make this the starting condition. Uh, so that's kind of a pain. In terms of testing your own plugin uh, to make sure your stuff is working, uh, my advice here uh, for getting started with a plugin is to always do it slowly and iteratively, or, or quickly and iteratively, but in little steps. Um, start out by putting in a plugin that really does nothing at all and then make little changes. Uh, because it's easy, particularly with XSLT, uh, it's easy to have a typo somewhere and then you keep coding for two hours and you try to test something. It's like, oh, what went wrong? Um, I know editing in Oxygen now, uh, you, can, you can do a lot with XSLT that saves you from those typos, uh, but it, it's still not necessarily gonna get everything right the first time. So yeah, as with any programming, uh, test early and often. Uh, so yeah, to, to start with any uh, plugin, I'd say grab a sample, whether it's your sample, one of the ones I'll point to, or, or whatever. Get one that does something similar. You know, if you want to override XHTML, get a plugin that overrides XHTML. Open the plugin.xml and change the ID. Don't forget to change the ID. You may want to rename the override file and then just strip out the code. At that point, you have a plugin that is essentially a no-op. It integrates, but it doesn't do anything. Try running, make sure you haven't broken anything. 
and start start running with a little bit of code. Yes. Did you say that you did not consider XSLT programming earlier? <laughs> did I do I not consider XSLT programming? Well, I, I suppose I have to admit it is, but uh, considering I've had dreams that involved XSLT, uh, and I, I I woke up without screaming, maybe a little bit of sweating. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I've spent too long in XSLT, and as I, I mentioned earlier, and I don't think this was to everybody, but to, to some people, uh, some of the XSLT that was in the toolkit that was written at this point maybe 12 years ago before there was a toolkit uh, that was my learning process for XSLT so if you dig into that I'm sorry um, I'm sorry I wouldn't write it that way anymore uh, most of that has been refactored actually as I you know spent more time with it and uh, yeah there's, there's been a lot of refactoring over time uh, tips for overriding XSLT in particular uh, yeah, well, you can read the slide. I don't want to just read the slide. Um, but basically, you, you need to create your override, start off with an override that does nothing so that you know that you have an override that, that isn't breaking things, and just start looking through the XSLT for the one that looks like what you want to override. If you want to override an element, look for the node that processes that element. If you want to override one of the stubs, like generate header, find that stub. Copy it into your file, run again, make sure it all still runs as, as you expect, and then start tweaking the code. Well, it's not that easy to find out which of the nodes. Yeah, sorry, it's not so easy. Yep, it's on. It's on. All right. Uh, so, as, as most times, it's not very easy to find out which of the nodes actually touched the last time the format or the attribute. We have so many of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll have a very nice little test from Lee in, in about two hours on that. Yeah. But nevertheless, is there any kind of an idea that you can trace it down and see, okay, the blue color was made by that node, kind of a debug mode? PDF is a lot harder than HTML. So I'll, I'll leave that for Lee. Um, you're welcome, Lee. Uh, for HTML, it's easier because most often, not always, the processing is confined to the element. You find whatever processes DT and you can you can override definition term processing. Yeah, PDF is a lot more difficult because there's so many calls out to name templates to do things. Uh, there, things are spread out across so many other files. Uh, does that answer the question poorly enough? <laughs> well, yeah, it answers the complexity. Okay, yeah. Uh, I did see Michael do a little twirl. I thank you for that. I am also just naturally loud. <laughs> Fair call, good point. Uh, so apologies to the folks online. Uh, there are also tools that will step through the XSLT one step at a time. So if you're not sure where exactly something happened, you can sort of say, you know, next step, next step. Ah, that's where things went horribly wrong. And uh, so that's sort of a standard sort of debugging uh, uh, approach. Um, but yeah, the, the other point is a sort of a tip. Um, I remember. I, I, I did some coding in that toolkit uh, a horribly long time ago, and I'm sure they've gotten rid of that now, and thank you. Uh, but a huge um, just paradigm shift for me was from procedural programming to the just, you know, do a by element type, and it makes it beautifully easy to override. Uh, and uh, so I think just one tip that I would suggest that I hope still applies is not to do procedural programming in your override. Uh, like actually use XSLT as an XSF, you know, in the way it's meant to be used, uh, and that way it cascades nicely. It 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 uh, um, and it will integrate beautifully, and and it in turn will also be overridable in nice ways. Yes. Um, you can uh, when you're overriding a template in a plugin, you can copy that template over or copy the entire file over. Do you have is there? Do you think there's a best practice for that? My best practice is to copy the template. Um, I know. I don't. I don't want to get into PDF. That code's so scary. Uh, if you follow Lee's book, I know it, it's generally involves copying files, and I don't know what the best practice is there. I'm. I'm yeah, I'm scared. For HTML, I definitely only copy the one template. Uh, the main reason for that, 
yeah, the, the main reason to only copy the one template is that when the toolkit's version comes out the next time, if you've changed how paragraph formats, your override still works. All the updates to every other element you still get with the updated toolkit. Um, in PDF, my preference is still probably just to do the template, but I'm, I'm scared of stepping on toes. Okay, so this is Yana. <laughs> my preference would be to only copy the single template uh, because some of the townships are quite large. So if you copy everything, um, you will have a nightmare when you upgrade. Yeah. Also, with uh, 2.0, we're migrating or to we'll be migrating to Excel P2, which has fairly strict data typing, and those data types, meaning the as attribute, have been added to the code base. So it starts to complain that if the base style sheet has a template in a given mode, and it expects to create a text node. And if your override starts to generate text nodes and elements and so forth, Saxon will actually just fail because that wasn't the expected uh, output. So with Excel T2 and Excel uh, T2, it will be easier. There, there will be more uh, constraints there to help you. So if I may reinterpret that, uh, Yarno will hunt you down if you don't do it the way he just <laughs> uh, Just one, one little tip uh, for working with plugins, something that a lot of people probably are not aware of, uh, but was added in 1.5.4. Uh, when a plugin is integrated, the toolkit will generate default properties for that plugin. And I'm, I'm told I'm at the end. Uh, so yeah. You get a plug. You get a yeah. You get a generated parameter. That way, you can reference other plugins without using a path. That means those plugins can move anywhere, change directory names with a version or something like that. Your stuff doesn't break. Use that. And the last thing, the sample plugins I promised. Um, this is what they look like. There we go. Come on, come on. There we go. I have a list of every different type of thing that I talked about. You know, does it have new ant code? Does it extend the preprocess? New transform type. If you want a plugin that does any of those, that's what the plugin is, and they're all available as zips, downloadable packages right below it. So, something to get you started if you haven't already started. And I think we're done. <laughs>